hello there. This is Vitriol's the Chess Noob, learning and having fun with chess. I'm really pleased to show you these three games. Uh, a really good example of the Vienna Gambit and the possibility of creating, uh, you know, creative, beautiful pieces of art on the chessboard by getting some beautiful checkmates. These three games I played as unrated games over the last month or so, and I've been hunting for beautiful checkmates. Because as per my new book, which is just about to be released, maybe next week, to quote myself, for the romanticist, it's not enough to simply win, but one must strive to win in style. Oh, let's go take a look. First game uh, is probably the simplest. This was a game of the Vienna Gambit, the Falkby variation, where Black accepted the Gambit. Oh, let's go take a look. So Vienna, Ga uh, Vienna Gambit starts with the Vienna game, which is e4, e5, knight, c3. Falkby variation is where they respond with the King's Knight and Vienna Gambit, f4. They accept the Gambit, which is basically a mistake because we push our e-pawn, Tax the knight. Knight doesn't look like it can go anywhere uh, on the board because everything is defended. Their best move, retreating the knight. That is their best move. Kind of why accepting the gambit is a mistake. And one of the uh, themes that tend to come out of the Vienna gambit is that white can often get a really, really big advantage in development. Now in this position, I would usually play knight to f3. Queen h4 check is a threat. The curious thing is it's actually not that good for black to do that, but it can be a bit tricky to play. So normally I develop the knight first. Uh, they you know, try to put a bit of pressure on that pawn, kind of makes sense. Maybe I'll dislodge my knight. That's often what black will be thinking. Okay, let's bolster that pawn. Uh, they now, you know, continue the same idea, pinning my knight. Well, relative pin because it's sort of pinned to the queen. Here the best move is probably, and the sensible move, is just to take back that point of material. Uh, it prevents uh, you know, the queen from coming here because the bishop can drop back like that. However, in this position I decided to play something a bit tricky. I'm going to dare black to take and play down that line, and instead I'm going to develop my bishop to c4 first. Bishop c4 pressures the f7 square, f7 pawn. Another tactical idea in Vienna is that we often want to attack down the uh, f file. Often it's very, very powerful. And here they took the bait, captures. You can see Stockfish says it's actually a mistake. After we capture back with the queen, they give the check. You can see inaccuracy. Look at that. You know, they're up a point of material but look at white's advantage. This is all a mistake. Now they're probably thinking that after g3, usually this is good for black because this looks like it's pinned. So if they take here now, the you know pawn forward, there's a discovered check. So maybe at least what they're gonna do is they'll just end up trading down, queens go off the board and they hold on to one or two points of material. That's probably what black was thinking. But here, mate in six. And it's made in six because remember, one of the ideas of the Vienna is that we want to attack down the F file and they just semi open the F file for me. There is a scholar's mate type attack, though it's not a mate because you know, the king can run. But let's see, because here we're going to see one of the checkmating motifs that can come out of the Vienna gambit, which is where we end up chasing Black's king, drag him off his drone, uh, off his throne, drag him off the back rank, pull him into the field of battle, corralling the king, and then very often we can do a checkmate, you know, all on his lonesome on the queen side on the A file. Let's see what that looks like. Queen captures the F7 pawn with check, king forced to move to D8. But now, we give another check. King force off the back rank. Has to move forward, one square, a d7. However, now what have we got? We've got the pawn forward. Again, they have to now move in front of their line of pawns. King forced to c6. I give another check. You notice their backwards retreat has closed. 
force forward. The knight now gives a check. Uh, king now comes here. I give another check. I force black's king to capture my knight. And you notice we're now uh, just about to enter turn 16. Black's queen forlornly on the other side of the board on f4. You know, the full field uh, across. Their king, you know, gazing across on a4. And in this position, my queen finishes the job, stabs Black's king in the heart all by himself. Queen to b3, mate. So, dragging the king off his throne, pulling him into the field of battle, and then giving mate. So this is a often a uh, tactical motif that's available when you're in a winning position in the Vienna Gambit. We're going to see a much cooler version of this in game three. Let's have a look at the second game. Second game, it's another Vienna game, but in this one, the opponent plays the Max Langer defense. So, e4, e5, knight c3, Vienna game, Max Langer, is when they develop the Queen's Knight in a, in a symmetrical fashion. Against the Max Langer, we still have Vienna Gambit, f4. Now, very commonly, against the Max Langer Vienna Gambit, Black will sensibly, you know, play d6, decline the gambit with d6. It's quite good for black. However, I discovered when I was researching for my new book that you can get the Legal's trap out of the Max Langer Vienna gambit. And if you look at the article that's linked to this video, I talk a little bit about uh, Harry Pillsbury, the US chess champion from the end of the 19th century. Uh, he actually played a game in a simo where he uh, got a version of the Legal's Trap. Pillsbury, extremely strong player. If in a sort of alternate history, he may well have become the third world chess champion. In uh, a tournament, I think in uh, 1895 or 96, he uh, halfway through the tournament, he was actually a full point ahead of Emmanuel Lasker, who was the second world chess champion at that point. But during that tournament, <laughs> due to some sort of a shenanigans, he caught syphilis and he started getting really sick towards the second half of the tournament, completely bombed out, almost got no points. But if he didn't get sick, he may well have won that tournament and that may have triggered a world chess champion uh, a match, a playoff between he and Alaska, and he may have well won at his peak performance. Now, in this position, let's see what happens. All right, develop the other knight. And the idea here is we want to control the d4 square, potentially pushing d4. But black now plays the bishop to the g4, pinning the knight. Now, this now gives me an idea. Here, rather than, you know, uh, doing anything else. I play a very tricky move. You can see Stockfish kind of disapproves a bit. Tricky move, which is bishop to c4. Once again, looking at that f7 square, because all the ingredients of the uh, Legal trap is now available, which is they're pinning my knight. I've got my knight and the bishop, you know, developed to their natural squares. Black has got the d pawn on d6. That's important. And they also must not have developed their king side pieces. So the bishop and the knight are still there. Here we potentially have the Legal trap. All right. They move their knight forward, trying to you know double team my knight. Here I give a little bit of a think and I capture their e pawn as if I oh no my queen hung my queen. Black couldn't resist. They capture the queen. Blunder, mate into the girl's trap. One of the most beautiful opening checkmates, a coordination of three minor pieces. Bishop captures f7 pawn. You notice this king only has one legal move. King must bomb cloud itself to e7. And now the second knight, and everything is closed. The girl's trap, move eight, beautiful checkmate. Absolutely lovely. Now let's have a look at the third game. And I'm really proud of this one. Just played this the other day. It almost gives some 
a, a Morphe-esque type vibe, so Morphe in the uh, mid-19th century was a romantic genius on the chessboard, and he got some absolutely amazing checkmates. Um, you know, basically just art on the chessboard. He, again, could have probably checkmated his opponent in a, in a simpler, more easy way, but when you're in the win, you want to, if you have the opportunity to create something very beautiful, why would you not do so? Let's see what happens. Now, this was another Falkbeer Vienna, uh, Vienna Gambit. So e4, e5, knight c3. You can see Falkbeer variation, king's knight, Vienna Gambit with f4. But just like the second game, they decline with d6. Second best response by black. Best response is the main line, but this is potentially very good. Knight forward, again, our goal is to try to control the d4 square. Here, they play a slowish sort of move, which is fine. And so I strike now with d4. Very interesting, playing in that way, almost potentially transposes back to a uh, to Vinegar main line. I think Stoffish thinks that capturing this way, or maybe this way is best. Yeah, this way is best. I capture this way. This is not quite as good. It can see, so I lose some of the advantage because it does end up a little bit more like the main line, which is potentially quite good for black. They take. That's fine. I just develop my bishop very slightly. Uh, they capture this way, which is fine. So being not afraid in sort of the Vienna game positions to get this very strong center pawn complex develop. I now short castle. Stockfish thinks, you know, moving the bishop again is better. I, I wasn't so sure about that. Again, focus potentially on that weak f7 pawn, weak f7 square. You will notice I also have much more development than uh, than black as well. They push, that's a blunder. And here I make use of my developmental advantage now to push my knight forward, a knight attack, two attackers on their weak f7 uh, pawn. What are they gonna do? That is a mistake because here, bang, I've got a fork of the rook and queen. One of the things about the Vienna game, Vienna Gambit, is you just get this massive advantage if black doesn't play carefully, if they don't develop quickly. All right, and here um, black probably is a beginner and they stumble a bit. They sort of crumble a bit under the pressure. So, you know, take the rook, there we go, give a check, king moves out of the way, take, they do this, but you know, knight jumps back with a, uh, with a check, uh, oh, sorry, with an attack, sorry, on the queen, and in this position, black actually makes a mistake and they blunder their queen. Tack. Here, of course, I am absolutely completely winning. I could win many, many ways. It's probably best is just to simplify and go into a winning endgame up material. What's the fun in that? Here, oh, let's try to get a beautiful checkmate. So, they sort of develop their bishop, moving out of the way, sure, whatever. Here I decide to, yeah, maybe let's, let's, let's move my attacking pieces, give a check. What are they gonna do? All right, king now forced here. Move my knight, potentially captures here, and you know, that would potentially pin their knight. They move their knight, uh, maybe thinking they're defending that pawn, but it's not because the knight moves, double check. Absolutely beautiful. King, same motif as before, dragged off the back rank, often onto the queen side, onto the A file. Let's see what happens. Capture, check, king move, check, sacrifice the knight, force them to take my knight, check. Look at that. Force now onto the A file, and here I started to see a glimpse of some greatness potentially. I give a check, force them to take my pawn, and now. I move the C pawn, check, force them onto my back rank. I've basically kidnapped Black's King completely away from their own officers, drag them, march them all the way into my territory, force them now to capture my Rook. They're now on my back rank in my dungeon of my castle and a Rook F1 checkmate on my back rank, their king went from a merry chase all the way down to my side, and now it's the end. Good game, GG. The big takeaway from this game is 
chess can be a vehicle for art and expression. Why play boring games? Play creative, exciting, beautiful chess. And that's what my new book is about. When it's released, please consider getting your own copy. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.